We are all in this room right now for two reasons. We want to be here, and we are able to be here. We want to be here because we like to learn. We like to challenge our thinking and explore new ideas. And I think that's relatable for most of the people in this world. Humans are curious beings. We yearn for knowledge no matter where we come from or how old we are. It's universal. But the second reason I mentioned, the ability to be here, unfortunately is not universal. And I'm not just talking about having the financial means. Each of you, to be here, had to know about this event ahead of time. You had to buy a ticket, and you had to arrange your travel. And I bet that at least part of that process required you to, at some point, connect to the internet. It's something we can do instantly whenever we like, and we don't even have to think about it. But for almost 50% of the world, that luxury doesn't exist. You may have heard this referred to as the digital divide. It's the lack of infrastructure in rural and remote parts of the world that prohibits billions of people from being able to easily access the online education, health, commerce, and other empowerment tools that you and I take for granted. And this problem also affects those of us that have internet access. I believe that when we, as humankind, are not fully connected, we're not reaching our full potential. Look around the room, what demographics are missing from this audience? What TED Talks are we not hearing because so many speakers reside outside of modern digital networks? We're all here to exchange information and ideas, but we're only tapping into half of the human experience. Clearly, this problem deserves a solution, but how do you connect everybody in the world? If you've ever flown in an airplane over a rural area, then you know just how spread apart civilization can be in some parts of the world. And using fiber, physical fiber that has to run under oceans and be dug through trenches, to connect every house, every school in the world, is financially infeasible. It will never happen. But if on the airplane you had a radio and could send signals to every house that you could see, suddenly the ground terrain and distance between two points are no longer obstacles in connecting them. Raise your altitude more until you reach space, and you'll be in what's called low Earth orbit. And a satellite there can provide connectivity to over a million square kilometers at a time. That's about the size of Egypt. And that capability is critical if you want a global network that can traverse oceans and mountains and socio-political boundaries. This idea isn't necessarily new or unique. And in fact, just last month, Amazon announced its own plans to launch a constellation of over 3,000 satellites in the spirit of global connectivity. But that announcement added them to an already long list of impressive companies who are aiming to do the same. This most recent trend was started about five years ago by the company I work for called OneWeb. In February, we launched our first satellites on our way to 2,000 satellites with the goal of bridging the digital divide. After our initial announcement in 2015, we were followed by the likes of SpaceX, Telesat, Boeing, and a few others. And that means that Amazon is a bit late to the party, but they're okay with that because they recognize that global data exchange is only going to increase as more and more people and devices get connected. There will be more than enough demand to support multiple large internet constellations. But is there enough space? And that's a good question to ask. In the entire history of human civilization, we've launched just over 8,000 satellites. The SpaceX constellation alone is proposed to be over 11,000 satellites. And they plan to start launching next week. If they do, and if everyone else does, then we could be launching in the next five years over twice as many satellites that we've ever launched in the previous 60. Perhaps we should take a step back and look at the space environment and its capacity to sustain such a large growth in a short amount of time. What are the risks? What could go wrong? What are the long-term impacts? 
these questions are some of the more responsible questions we should ask before any type of large-scale industrial deployment. But as we know, it's not done often enough. In the early 90s, John Sylvan invented a convenient way to brew a single serving of coffee. You know what I'm talking about, those little plastic cups. It was a brilliant invention, extremely popular, but what John didn't predict was that a few years later, billions of these cups, which at the time were non-recyclable and non-biodegradable, would be piling up in our landfills. To the credit, manufacturers now strive to make these 100% recyclable, which will help the problem, but it could have been avoided in the first place if the outcomes were, were considered before deployment, if it had been regulated before it became an issue. I think we're at that threshold point right now in the space industry. I know what you're thinking. Why don't we just launch fewer satellites? And as a constellation designer, I wish it were that simple. But it's actually physics and not pure capitalistic greed that drives the numbers so high. See, traditionally, communication satellites are launched into a very special orbit called geostationary orbit. And that name tells you all you need to know. Satellites there are stationary as viewed from Earth. They just stay in the same point in the sky 24-7. And that's very convenient because the antennas that we put on the ground and on our buildings don't have to move to track and communicate with that satellite. It makes it cheap and simple. But there's a drawback. There always is. Satellites in this orbit are about 36,000 kilometers away from Earth. And sending signals back and forth at the speed of light can take over 500 milliseconds. That may not sound like much, but it actually has a big impact in how we interact with each other. Musicians playing together in a band, for example, need less than 20 milliseconds of delay between them to stay in rhythm. Online gamers want less than 100 milliseconds of delay. And two people in a conversation will start speaking over top of one another and missing words if there's more than two or 300 milliseconds of delay. So how do we decrease that delay time? Well, simple. We bring the satellites closer to us. Now they're no longer geostationary, and they see much smaller area. So we need to multiply the number of satellites to make sure that every point on Earth has coverage. And that's why you're seeing constellations being proposed with thousands of satellites. So if that's the answer, is there a concern? Should we be worried about having so many satellites? Well, um, imagine, if you will, that you're at a football match, and it's a really big game, maybe like the game tonight. And outside are 20,000 cars in the parking lot. After the game, consider how careful you have to be while driving home to make sure that you don't run into any other car. It's precarious, stressful, but possible, right? Now imagine that that parking lot is the size of the entire surface of Earth, bigger even. That's a lot of space in between each car, and with the right care and control, there shouldn't be any, any issues. So why do some people say that space is getting crowded? What's the big deal? Well, to complete this car analogy, we have to imagine that everyone is driving about 25,000 kilometers per hour. And there are also no traffic signs in space, no rules of the road at all, actually. It's starting to sound a bit worrisome. And if there is a collision, we're not talking about a dent or a scratch that you can just buff out. We're talking complete catastrophic breakup. Thousands of pieces of debris scattered far and wide. This has actually happened. Ten years ago, two satellites collided, and some pieces from that event are still in space today. The core issue is predictability and control. If I can predict something is going to be in my way, and I can control my trajectory, then I can steer around that object. Of the two satellites that collided ten years ago, only one was controllable. The other one was no longer working. And now none of the pieces can be controlled. As for predictability, 
Clearly, it wasn't good enough 10 years ago. We've gotten better since, but we can still only track and predict that which we can see using telescopes and radar. And that means we're missing everything smaller than about 10 centimeters. And if you can't see it, you can't avoid it. It's like driving blindfolded. In the worst case scenario, the debris from one collision could go on to impact another satellite, causing more debris and less predictability and control in the environment. And the fear is this runaway domino effect impacting more and more satellites. That nightmare scenario actually has a name. In 1978, NASA scientist Donald Kessler theorized this possibility, and it was thus given the name Kessler syndrome. It's a future we must avoid. When we started OneWeb, my job was to design the constellation and its operations. And I remember vividly when one of my colleagues looked me straight in the eye and said, you know, if you screw this up, Mike, they won't call it Kessler syndrome. They'll call it Mike Lindsay syndrome. You can imagine the pressure I felt. And from that point on, I was committed to making sure we do everything we can to minimize our impact on the environment. And that starts with a simple and well-known principle, leave no trace. That means that each satellite, when it completes its mission, we call it back down so that it will quickly and safely burn up in Earth's atmosphere. And this prevents hundreds of dead satellites from just wandering around in space, becoming objects for everyone else to avoid. If that sounds like a no-brainer, you may be surprised to learn that even the strictest countries allow their dead satellites to remain in space for up to 25 years. We also go to great lengths to make sure we don't have failures that prevent our satellites from being able to maneuver and deorbit. High reliability is paramount. But what if? And that's important to ask any time the environment is in question. What if, after all this preventative work, something unexpected still happens and the spacecraft can't hear us when we call it home? or it can hear us, but it can no longer move. We've asked ourselves these questions since day one. And we believe that the space industry as a whole must work together on solutions for environmental remediation. Unfortunately, today, there are no practical means for going up into space and retrieving a non-responsive satellite. But at OneWeb, we are working on solutions now in anticipation of future capabilities. And part of that means making sure the capture process is as easy as possible when that technology arrives. And so every one of our satellites is launched with a grapple fixture, a sort of easy-to-use handle that can be grabbed by a robotic arm or other device. And not only does that make that easier to connect with and push and pull, but ideally it will also be a major step towards standardization in the industry. It's much more cost-effective if a single capture design can address satellites of all different shapes and sizes because they all have the same interface, kind of like a USB connector. And finally, we are working with a number of organizations and companies to develop new concepts in space debris removal. We believe that this capability is essential to the long-term sustainability of Earth orbit. Yes, this project comes with risk risk to the space environment, as well as risks associated with the proliferation of digital culture. But if we assess the potential outcomes ahead of time, if we are thoughtful in our design, proactive in our regulation and standardization, and if we devise remediation measures, then that risk can be managed, minimized, and in some cases eliminated. Too often have we seen environmental problems ignored until they become global crises. So we owe it to ourselves and our future to stay ahead of this one, to make sure that space debris doesn't become more of an issue than it already is. Of course, the safest thing would be to never launch any satellites at all, but progress necessitates risk. If we can agree that internet access is a human right that should be available to everyone, regardless of where they live, then we will need thousands more satellites in space.
And if we are careful to do this correctly, then we will have a long-term and sustainable solution to bridging the digital divide. Thank you.